So the main point of chapter seven. Uh, have a look at verse 24 there on the inside of your sheets uh, at the bottom of the, uh, that section of the uh, passage. Verse 24, brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God's called them. Or just have a look at the footnote there that I've put in there. Verse 24, um, in the ESV, the English Standard uh, Version, another translation uh, says, in whatever condition each was called, uh, there let them remain with God. God called you to follow his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, often in Christian language, we talked about this last week, we use the, the language of calling as if it's about your job or your future. It's, it's not. Um, almost every occurrence of the word calling in the New Testament is about being called to follow Christ. And your circumstances are not your calling. Your calling is to follow Christ. And in fact, as we've been learning, we need to remain in that situation or be content to remain. Uh, Paul says uh, just earlier on, if, if he can gain his freedom, the, the, the slave, then, then that's fine. Um, but actually, your circumstances is where God has put you. And he's chosen you to follow Christ in those circumstances. And he wants a, a varied body. He doesn't want a whole load of pastors and missionaries um, because that would ruin their jobs. You know, I, I don't get that much interaction with people on the cold face of normal life. Um, but if you're not a pastor or a missionary, uh, you probably do uh, get a lot of interaction with people uh, who aren't Christians and the opportunity to witness to them. God wants you to live wholeheartedly for him in the situation that you're in, even if it's as bad, and Paul uses the worst possible example, even if it's as bad as being a slave. So if you've got the worst job in the world, as far as you're concerned, God has called you to live wholeheartedly for Christ in that situation and not to seek to change your circumstances as the be all and end all. Don't believe the lie that changing your circumstances will make you more happy and more fulfilled. Uh, being fulfilled in this life has very little to do with your life circumstances. Being fulfilled in this life has very little to do with your life circumstances. And yet the world screams at you, you need to be more like this, more beautiful, follow these adverts, follow that, do that, have a more fulfilling career, and then you'll be more fulfilled. No, being fulfilled is remaining in the situation God has put you in with him, having a deep relationship with him, undivided devotion to the Lord. That's what he calls us to. Be who you are in Christ. That's what we've been looking at as the whole theme of the letter. And it's not surprising that the main point in this passage fits with the main point of the whole letter. Uh, be who you are in Christ. You are holy in Christ. You are perfect. You are rescued. You are redeemed. You are precious in God's sight. He sees you as perfect because of what Jesus has done for you. He will hold you fast because Jesus has died for you. And so be who you are in Christ. Don't forget who you are and then live as something else. Be who you are in Christ. Live it out. As Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 says, Be content with what you have because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise that's supposed to ride through the, the death of loved ones. The pain of a difficult marriage. The frustrations of singleness and longing to be married. Be content with what you have because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Shamelessly pursuing fullness of life in Christ. And it's not a fullness of life. It's not just a mere happiness. It's deep, rich. And it's a realisation that this world is passing. And, and as someone prayed this morning at, uh, uh, at Christ Church Balham when we were praying in the light of uh, little Keziah's death, um, they gave thanks to God that at the time that Keziah's parents, Ross and Tansy, will not be with her is infinitesimally small compared to the time that they will be with her for all eternity. <coughs> this life is short. This life is passing away, as we'll think about more next week. And therefore, be content in your relationship with God, which will last for eternity, not chasing after things that won't satisfy. Idols. That promise so much and deliver so little. 
And with all that in mind, then we get into Paul's answering the specific questions that the Corinthians had about singleness and marriage. And they were a messed up people. Uh, there was so much sex of all kinds going on in Corinth that some of them were saying, well, gosh, that looks bad. So if we're married, maybe we shouldn't have sex at all because sex is a dirty thing. And there's been dodgy teaching in uh, so-called church history um, about you know, the Holy Spirit leaving the room when a couple have sex because it's a bit embarrassing. No, God made sex. God made sex as a good thing. God made sex a good thing. And Paul's point in the first half, this first section of, of uh, 1 Corinthians 7, under the big theme of uh, contentment in Christ, is if you're married, if your circumstances that you're married, act married. And in response to the specific question that the, the Corinthians had, should, uh, what's that, uh, verse 1 there, uh, some of them were saying, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, as in his wife. And Paul says, no, 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 if you're married, have lots of sex, and that's really important, and that is a marriage saver. It's so important, because as we know, those of us who are married, you can't just turn it on like that. There needs to be deep, real relationship that is working in every aspect of life in order for sex to work. And so, realising that we need to have lots of sex as married couples is a marriage saver because it forces us to go back to the fundamentals. Now, we'll come on to that a little bit more, but um, actually, let me just say, uh, the little illustration I used last week um, that I got from a friend of mine, in fact, it's been used loads and loads, that, that illustration of fire. Um, so fire in your wood burner, fire in your, in your gas boiler is a wonderful thing. It keeps you warm. Uh, you need it. We, we love it. Uh, but a fireplace uh, with no fire in it is just a memorial. And it's a sad thing. So if you're married, sex is like fire. Um, you need it, and you need to light that fire regularly. Um, but if you're not married, uh, the only place for sex is within marriage. And so don't bring it out into the living room, uh, because then it's dangerous, uh, just like fire in the rest of the house uh, is dangerous. Um, and so uh, if you're married, uh, make time, save the energy, work on your marriage. Uh, and it's about responsibilities, not rights, as we saw. Uh, there's total equality. The same thing he says to the husband, he says to the wife, and so on. Um, if you're married, act married. And then Paul says, verse 7, uh, I wish that you were all, sorry, I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. Uh, one has this gift, another has that. And sometimes people uh, have misinterpreted this to, for Paul to be saying, um, uh, some people who are single have the gift of marriage and therefore they need to get uh, married. Uh, but that's, uh, that's not the case. If you're single, you've got the gift of singleness. If you're married, you've got the gift of marriage. Your circumstances should remain the same um, and you need to trust God in that. Now we move on to the second point. Um, and if you're effectively married, Paul says, get married. Now let's have a look at verse 8, and I want you to see that with me, because it's not necessarily immediately obvious on first reading, um, but I want to try and convince you that that's what this is saying. So uh, Paul talks, verse 8, to the unmarried and the widows. And you're thinking, well, how can Alex say if you're effectively married? Well, this is the middle of a section that is very clearly addressed to those who are married and thinking about either behaving not as married or even getting a divorce. And there's, a, there's another section after verse 25 that is all about the single. So why is Paul suddenly just throwing in a bit about the unmarried? Well, let me keep reading. Now, to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. So it's, it's likely Paul uh, was widowed himself and he uh, decided to stay unmarried. And then the passage says, if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But you'll see the little footnotes put there is a quote from the NRSV, another translation. And you could translate it, or if they are not being self-controlled. And actually, if you um, just click in, there's lots of Bible tools, you don't have to be able to speak Greek, you can hover over the words. And if you click into the words, you'll, you'll struggle to find, but you won't find any idea of ability. There's nothing about cannot. That word, I've put it in italics, 
uh, in the printouts because the word can is not in the Greek. It reads literally, if they're not controlling themselves. And um, so people have inserted the word cannot, but actually I think it's much more likely are not controlling themselves. If they're not controlling themselves, well, you just put in the word are, um, that can be glossed over in the Greek, but the word can isn't there. So if they are not controlling themselves, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. And so um, this uh, section is not saying that um, self-control is a gift. I mean, some people would say, oh, well, I've clearly not got the gift of marriage because I'm struggling with self-control, um, and so I should get married. Well, if that was the case, then that would completely undermine Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 6 that we saw before Christmas, um, that we should flee sexual immorality. Virtually every young man could come back to Paul and say, well, uh, you say flee sexual immorality, Paul, but, you know, abstinence isn't my gift. I'm, I'm just looking at porn or sleeping around until I can exercise my gift of marriage because I've obviously got the gift of marriage. Well, that's nonsense. That's not the right response. But what if a wife or a husband never turns up? There are many single people who might think that they burn with passion but are simply unable to find a, a spouse. And so don't undermine the clear teaching on contentment which is the main point of the whole chapter. If, if you're uh, not married, you've got no prospect of getting married, and you're, you feel you're burning with passion, then pray with a close Christian friend uh, and, and talk it through and work out how to flee sexual immorality. But what Paul is talking to here, in the context of those who are married, I think is effectively those who are cohabiting, those who ha ha are having regular sexual experiences with one other person. And Paul's saying, if you are not controlling yourselves, then it's better to marry than to burn with passion. You know, call it what it is. Um, and actually, this is wonderfully liberating um, to, to encourage people to, to give a name to what they're living out anyway. And in, in our culture, where cohabiting is now almost more common than marriage, um, it's a wonderful thing to say. Not split up, but actually live out under God what you are now. If you're, if you're effectively married, get married. It's also uh, a warning to those who are, who are going out and are living as if they're uh, effectively married, and not just cohabiting or sharing a room, but uh, going on holiday together, just the two of them, maybe sharing a hotel room. Um, it's, it could be uh, applied to engaged couples, focusing far more on the wedding than on the marriage. You know, our culture focuses more on weddings than marriage, doesn't it? Uh, it's all about the wedding day. It's all about the big wedding. Whereas Paul says, no, it's about marriage. And if you are not or you are really struggling to control yourselves, then get married. Um, I remember when John and Sarah got married, you said, oh, it's frustrating. We're going to have to have a, a relatively long engagement um, because getting family, um, family and friends over from... Uh, from Africa and so on. Is that right? Yeah, you said when we got married. Oh, sorry, when we got engaged. Yeah. Sorry, you said we're going to have to have a, a, very, a fairly long engagement. Um, uh, John's getting married in March. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, we, we don't want to focus always on the, on the wedding. Um, uh, so we want to encourage uh, friends who are uh, heading towards marriage to, to get married quickly uh, if they've uh, decided on that. We'll think about that more next week. Um, because marriage, is, uh, marriage for, uh, for those who are effectively married is better than singleness. That's what Paul is saying. Um, and the reason that uh, we want to encourage people towards marriage is because, as we saw a little bit last week, it, uh, marriage is supposed to be a relationship based on unconditional love. Unconditional love. And I do think this is something that we can talk about, maybe in the question time as well, talk about how do we communicate that to uh, friends who aren't Christians, who would naturally and understandably assume it's mad for you not to sleep together before you get married. Why wouldn't you? And everything else you try before you buy. And everything else you test the water. Uh, but actually, to uh, foster a, a relationship built on unconditional love, in which there's security and confidence, uh, is a wonderful and a beautiful thing. And to bring the try-before-you-buy mentality into uh, 
a potential marriage relationship uh, will carry all kinds of problems then into the marriage uh, because uh, in the sexual relationship there'll be the need to perform and to prove yourself and we see that's a massive issue in sexual health uh, across the country um, and uh, the idea of faking it in a real marriage um, of unconditional love there should be never faking it in sex life because um, if it's not satisfying, then selfless love isn't working. And so you talk about it and you say, no, that doesn't please me, that does, and so on and so on. But in a relationship that's tried before you buy, well, normally the woman will fake it for the sake of the man because she wants him to buy. And there's that insecurity and there's that fear. What if he lets me go? Um, and there are so, so many uh, relationships and... Uh, it's, I know it's um, a stereotype to say it, but on the whole, uh, there are men who are very happy with getting everything uh, they want from a relationship without the commitment. And there were women waiting uh, for the man to ask them to marry and to commit to them and give them genuine, unconditional love. And it's painful to watch, and it's a horrible thing to inflict. And I've got many friends who either are now married or who are going out at the moment, and she is desperate to be married and to experience probably an over uh, uh, higher expectations than she had, should have of a happily ever after. And yet he's keeping her waiting and keeping her waiting. And it's painful to watch it. Um, and so this is a kind command of Paul's to, if you're effectively married, then get married and enjoy that unconditional love that is a picture of the gospel. Um, Penny asked me a very helpful question uh, at the end of last week about a, a scenario she knew of where there was um, a young couple who were um, uh, sleeping together in their church um, used this verse to say you, you really should get married because you're sleeping together and so uh, get married. And I think that was right advice in and of itself. But as we chatted, we worked out that actually the danger was that they were missing the main point. Uh, that what that couple needed to hear first and foremost was to find contentment in Christ and to delight in him and to want his good word and to, to know that they wanted to shamelessly pursue fullness of life in Christ and as a result of that, uh, get married um, in order to um, uh, live the life that uh, God has put them in. Um, but instead there's a danger that we just go straight to the rule rather than hearing the principle. So don't miss the, the main principle. Next point on your sheets. If you're struggling in your marriage, don't be hard-hearted. If you're struggling in your marriage, don't be hard-hearted. And this is where I want to spend a little bit more time. Um, Paul says, verse 10, To the married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. Now, the reason Paul puts that in there is I think because already at this very early stage, this is one of the earliest letters in the New Testament, uh, written in the 40s uh, AD, so uh, within about 10 years of Jesus' uh, resurrection. And, um, uh, and yet already the gospel accounts are circulating. Um, and so we don't know whether they had Matthew or Mark or Luke or John or snippets of, um, of those. Um, but it was very clear that Jesus had been asked this question about divorce. And Paul wants them to say, hey, look, don't you remember? We looked at that passage that Jesus explicitly spoke on. And so he says that thing. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord, Jesus. A wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. Same command to both. Now, because he says this phrase, not I but the Lord, I want us to look to that, phrase, that section in the Gospels where Jesus is asked this question. So have a look on your sheets uh, down at the bottom of uh, the passage there, Mark chapter 10, verses 5 to 12. And the church leaders in the day, um, so it's just there on your sheets, Mark 10, uh, verse 5 to 12. Um, uh, the, the Pharisees uh, come to Jesus and they ask him, is divorce permitted? And it's a pretty, bit of a tricky question um, uh, because there's all kinds of controversy at the day, uh, during the day as to how much or how little um, divorce should be allowed. And, um, and yet Jesus says this amazing thing. He says, verse 5, 
It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this divorce law, this law. Uh, The reason Moses permitted divorce is because your hearts were hard. But, verse 6, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let's no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. So Jesus goes right back to the creation principle uh, before the fall. And those quotes in uh, verses 6 to 9 are straight from uh, uh, Genesis uh, before the fall. God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So marriage is one man, one woman, one flesh for life. And sex is like the glue that makes them one flesh. And you need to keep having sex because it's like that glue that holds them together. But if you rip that apart... It's like if you had two bits of paper there glued together. If I rip them apart, well, you're never going to get a hold again. And it's right that we use the phrase um, about people's uh, husband and wife, your other half. Once you're married, in some ways, you're only half a person on your own. Uh, God has uh, made you one flesh and one flesh union for life. And therefore, what God has joined together, Jesus says, let no one separate. And the only reason uh, for, uh, for divorce, Jesus says, is because of hard hearts. And so if you're struggling in marriage, the command not to separate or get divorced is don't be hard-hearted. Either too hard-hearted to change or too hard-hearted to forgive. Maybe you know there's a challenge in your relationship and... Uh, uh, either you or the other person, is um, you want them to desperately change. But maybe you need, you're too hard-hearted to forgive. Um, or you're the person who knows you should change and you're just thinking, oh, well, I just want to live my life my way. Well, you're not one person anymore on your own. You're half a person. And so you're one flesh with your husband and your wife and so you need to be uh, ready to change. But hard-heartedness in that sense of unwillingness to change or unwillingness to forgive is is a denial of the gospel. And our marriages are supposed to be pictures of the gospel. The wonder of God who looks at his people like a, a bride. And even though they're unfaithful to him and they run away, this picture is used again and again in the Old Testament, God forgives them and comes after them and is married to them and and calls them back to a a satisfying marriage relationship with himself. If you're married, your, your marriage is only a picture of that reality of God and his people. And it's made possible because Jesus is God who took flesh to humanity to himself. God the Son took humanity to himself and lived the life that we failed to live and died in order to win his bride back not because of any beauty in her, but because of what he was going to do to transform her and make her beautiful by bringing her back to himself and marrying her. And that's what was going on on the cross. Jesus was dying for his bride. And we look forward at the end of the Bible to the wedding feast when uh, God the Son will come down and meet his bride, the church, and there will be... uh, a marriage celebration. And so if your marriage, which is just a picture of that wonderful relationship with God and his people, is full of hard-heartedness and failure to forgive or failure to change, then your marriage is denying the gospel and missing out on the wonder of the gospel. There is power in the good news of the Lord Jesus and uh, what he calls us to in following him for change, genuine change. And if both parties have soft hearts and are willing to admit their failures and to forgive the other person, then any marriage is savable. 
And so we need to keep on praying to be able to change and to be able to forgive. And so husbands and wives who are here, what is it that you are, what patterns are you building up in your marriage that actually denies the gospel? It's worth remembering the wedding vows that you said. The Church of England wedding vows go like this. Alex, will you take Lucy to be your wife? Will you love her, comfort her, honour and protect her, and forsaking all others, be faithful to her as long as you both shall live? I will, I said. And then, when you're exchanging rings, I take you, Lucy, to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death us do part. Husbands, are you cherishing your wife? Are you cherishing her? Are you thinking proactively as a man, how can I think ahead to ways to cherish my wife? Are you, are you think, think back to when you found her attractive in the first place and you planned all kinds of lovely date nights and ways to do things together. Have, have you given up on that? Have you just assumed, oh, well, we're just, you know, we're married now and that's the thing and, you know, it's important to stay married, but, um, you know, boring. <laughs> have you got into the, the culture that you see on stag do's, you know, where the guy goes around with a ball and chain. And actually forget that you promised that you would cherish her till death us do part. Wives, have you forgotten that promise that you made to your husband? Are you giving time to seducing him? Are you giving time to... Uh, to, to prioritise him and his needs, even when he's rubbish at looking out for yours? Are you together agreeing fixed times in the diary where you spend time together? I think it's a great principle for every couple to have a date night every week um, and to woo each other again, to, to, to flirt and to... Um, remind each other to talk about all the things that matter, to pour out your heart. Are you giving that time? Are you really listening? There are all kinds of uh, helpful things like marriage courses and books that you could read either together or go on together. And I just hugely recommend them. Every time I've done that with Lucy, we found it just so, so helpful. And we need to keep doing it. And it's really hard. And we need to ask for help. You see, our marriages, because they're a picture of the gospel, will be under attack, will be under spiritual attack all the time. And so in a church that is open and able to cry together and suffer together, we need to be asking for help. <coughs> and as single people, don't think that once a couple is married, they don't need you anymore. I remember my closest Christian friend said to me when I was about a year into marriage, and I was like, we haven't met up enough together, Tim. And he said, well, I suppose now you're married, you don't need me so, more, and I, so, so much anymore. And I said to him, I need you all the more. I need you all the more. I need you to be there for me, asking me these questions. Am I living up to the promises that I made? Because you're outside the situation, you can help me live out the gospel, as I can help my single friends to live out the gospel in, in being like the church who's waiting for their true husband to come back. There's a, an elder and his wife at Balham who were very open about struggles in their marriage. And it was just such a huge encouragement to hear them talking openly about how they, they went on marriage counselling. And it wasn't a sign of weakness or immaturity, quite the opposite. And so if your marriage feels anything less than a one flesh union of delight, then talk to someone. And not just to each other, talk to someone outside the marriage. Lucy and I both have an agreement that uh, we know exactly who each other's closest Christian friends are. And if there's something going wrong and it's hard, we have carte blanche to, to ring that person. And Lucy can ring Tim and say, Tim, you need to sort Alex out. Things aren't working. We're finding it really hard to communicate. And, and he does, and, and he will. Do you have that? 
It's so important also for the sake of children, of course. And I think I just feel so blessed by the kindness of God that my parents uh, loved each other romantically until the day my father died. And I would say that my greatest security in life, in just everyday life, uh, my parents weren't Christians for most of my father's life, uh, but they loved each other romantically and were committed to each other and they understood these principles even if they uh, didn't necessarily see that they came clearly from the Lord. And, um, and that's given me immense security and confidence growing up. And I know of uh, friends of um, someone special to me who uh, divorce happened. And um, when, the father, when, the, when the dad first separated from his wife, a uh, little boy, aged about seven, picked up a, a photo of husband and wife on the marriage day and said, does daddy not love us anymore, mummy? And it's not just the children who suffer, it's the church, it's your friends, and so on. If you're struggling in your marriage, don't be hard-hearted. You are a sinful failure, I am a sinful failure. And you have been placed by God with another sinful failure. And it's really hard. It's really hard as two people who want to be in charge come together. But God uses that to heighten and, and show our sin. So don't cover it up as if you need to prove yourself to be better than you are. I know, husbands, that you are sick. You're so sick that the eternal Son of God had to die bleeding and naked on a cross for you. And wives, I know the same about you. And so if you say we're really struggling in our marriage, it's no surprise. It's no surprise. You don't just need to tell the pastor. <coughs> Find people in the church who you can, you can talk to about this. If we're not, we're just faking it. Lastly, if you're married to a non-Christian, trust God with it. This is, this is uh, raw for a few, but it's potentially there for many. I know um, close friends of ours, in fact, uh, uh, Henry's uh, godmother's husband, his dad was a pastor and turned away from the Lord. And his wife ended up married to an unbeliever. We're, none of us are immune from this. Uh, but if you're married to a non-Christian, trust God with it, Paul says. Verse, verse 12, there on the sheets, back on the sheets. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. <coughs> Even in hard circumstances, uh, see that the Lord has placed you in that. Verse 14, for the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. The, the word sanctified is the same root as the word holy, and it doesn't mean that they're saved. We get to see that in a minute. Uh, but it means they get to benefit from the privileges of being connected to the Lord's people. Uh, it says there then, end of verse 14, otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are sanctified or they are holy too. And that doesn't mean that, that children are automatically saved by being part of a church family or husbands or wives are un automatically saved. But they get exposed to the wonder of the gospel and the gospel is the power of God to bring life to the dead. And so don't think that somehow you're infected by being married to someone who's not a Christian. Quite the opposite. You, you have the opportunity to share the wonderful good news of the Lord Jesus with them. But tragically, verse 15, if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. If you're abandoned, then you don't need to, in some desperate attempt to obey the rules, as it were, uh, keep things together. God has called us to peace. And verse 16, how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? It's very important. We... We can't do things on our own, which shows us that actually every marriage, every relationship should be covered in prayer. And we must be praying for our brothers and sisters in these situations just as much and if not more than we pray for those who are in seemingly healthy marriages. But it's worth saying at this point and as we 
uh, close and I open the floor to questions. Um, this also has implications for the man or woman who wants to go out with someone who's not a believer. Um, sometimes people say, oh, well, um, uh, I really want to be married and I've met this wonderful person and um, uh, you know, maybe because I'm a Christian then, then they'll become a Christian through me. But actually, the question there, verse 16, how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? And the situation of being in a mixed marriage, as in uh, with a Christian and a non-Christian, is, is very, very painful. I have two very close friends who grew up as children in that situation, and they both said, I, I wouldn't wish it on anyone, just seeing that, that tension. Now, there are blessings that God can bring in the midst of the pain, and both of those uh, children in that relationship are absolutely flourishing in the Lord. And God has used that painful situation to, to shape and develop them. It, but it is very hard. And, and so if you're in it because the Lord has placed you in it, then trust him in it. If you're single or if you've got friends who are single and they're contemplating that situation, then, then help them to see that is, that is not right. And actually all they're doing is just creating an idol out of marriage. They're turning a good thing of marriage into a God thing and saying, I must have this, even if it causes me to disobey the summary verses of uh, the chapter. So in summary, if you're, if you're married, act married, uh, verses 1 to 16, uh, then we see this middle section, contentment in Christ, verses 17 to 24. Then we'll look at next week, being a single Christian is a huge privilege, a huge privilege, and Paul is just immensely positive about singleness. And having friends who taught me that while I was single, just so, so helpful. It is not a second-class citizen position, but we'll talk, think about that next week. And then the summary verses. And we're going to look at these now, um, because I think they're very relevant to what we've just looked at. So um, if you turn over your sheets, uh, you'll see there on the, on the back page, verse 39. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes. So there's the principle there first. If you're married, stay married. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. So, but if her husband dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes. Uh, so you're free, uh, but he must belong to the Lord. It's a very clear command in the middle of this, this summary verse using the example of a woman who's married who then is widowed. If you are single and you're getting married, your husband or wife must belong to the Lord. It's so important. And we can think about why more deeply. But, verse 40, in my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is. And I think that I too have the Spirit of God. And it seems he's slightly mocking uh, the Corinthians there who think they're so spiritual. Of course, um, Paul, uh, the apostle, has uh, the wisdom from God's Holy Spirit. And so the summary there is, if you're married, stay married. If you're single, you're free to marry, but stay single. That's the, the summary of the whole chapter. Um, but it's such an important point there of uh, if you or friends of yours are um, single and looking uh, to be married, but to someone who's not in the Lord, then, then actually that's not an opening to them. Uh, and we shouldn't uh, encourage that. It can lead to very painful and difficult circumstances. Okay. Um, let me pray, and we'll have, we've got five minutes for, for questions. Sorry, Ed, I knew this would happen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, teaching us in your word. Um, Please help us to be a church that doesn't idolise marriage as the happily ever after, which it's not. Uh, that's to come when Jesus returns. But also help us to see it as the wonderful picture of the gospel that it is and a tool for the uh, shaping of those who are married and therefore to uh, prioritise marriage and, and seek to help each other in our marriages uh, to fulfil our wedding vows of loving and cherishing and caring for uh, our husbands and our wives. Please, as uh, married and single, would we help each other as married couples to, 
to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.